Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. Today I'm going to talk about the movie Lady Bird. I just saw it tonight and I thought, man, I should do a podcast about this. So it's late at night now. I turned on the microphone here and here we go. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. The This movie has gotten fantastic reviews. It has a currently a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, which is really unheard of. Um, I gave it an eight out of 10, maybe a seven, maybe a, you know, seven or eight out of 10. I wouldn't say that it's like mind blowing, but it is definitely a good movie. It's directed by Greta, Greta Gerwig. Greta Gerwig has in the last 10 years or so been in a number of movies, but the movies I remember her from, the first movie I remember her from was Greenberg. Um, it's a very interesting movie movie that I liked, uh, to, to Rome with Love, a Woody Allen movie. And then she was in Francis Ha, which she also co, uh, co co co-writed. She, she had, a, I think, a small part in Jackie. I don't really remember her in that movie. And then she wrote and directed Lady Bird, Lady Bird and she's also a voice in the up- upcoming Wes Anderson movie, Isle of Dogs. Um, she is married to Noah Bum- Bumbach, Bum- Bumbach, I don't know how to pronounce his name, who has worked on a number of Wes Anderson movies, including Life Aquatic, Fantastic Mr. Fox. He, he's co-written those with Wes Anderson. But he's also written and directed his own movies, Squid and the Whale, Greenberg, uh, While We're Young, and, and this year, the Meyerowitz stories. So two, uh, it's like you got a power couple in Greta and Noah, and their ability to write and direct. The movie stars um, Sorsha, Sorsha Ronan, I think is how you pronounce it, Sorsha, Sorsha Ronan. She was in Atonement, The Way Back. She's been in a bunch of movies, but the movies that I uh, know her from are Atonement, 2007, 2010, The Way Back, uh, which is a pretty good movie. Um, it's about It's a true story about these prisoners in Russia trying to escape. Uh, 2011, Hannah. She actually plays Hannah. 2014, the Grand Buda- Budapest Hotel. She's the girl with the Italy uh, birthmark on her face. And then Brooklyn. She was the lead in Brooklyn, which is a pretty amazing movie. Laura Metcalf plays Sorsha Ronan's mother, Lori Metcalf. I, she's been in a bunch of stuff, but the only thing I remember her from was from Roseanne. She was Roseanne's sister, Jackie, if you remember that TV show. It also stars Lucas Hedges, who was in Moonrise Kingdom, Manchester by the Sea, and Three Billboards. Um, you, if you saw Manchester by the Sea, he's the he's the kid, Lucas Hedges, a great actor, uh, very lots of promise with him. And in this movie, he really gets to kind of shine in a way that in the other movies he wasn't able to, in my opinion. Uh, and also, there's a. a an actress, Beanie Feldstein, who is the younger sister of Jonah Hill. And she looks very similar to Jonah Hill. <laughs> it's, it's a, her and him look very similar. Okay. So let's get into the psychology of, of the movie. Um, there's so much I can say about it, but what I will say is that it's a very accurate portrayal of an enmeshed relationship between a mother and a daughter. Enmeshed is what we call this in family therapy circles. Basically, it means that there's there's overlapping identities, meaning that they don't really think of themselves as individuals. They think of themselves as um, part of each other. They're extremely involved in each other's lives. There's lots of anxiety between them. Uh, for example, the mother never knocks. There's a scene where um, the father knocks on the door and uh, the daughter is like, come in, dad. And dad opens the door and he's like, how'd you know it was me? And he's like, well, mom never knocks. So, and there's scenes where the mom kind of invades her space when she's in the bathroom and she doesn't like it when she locks the bathroom door. And there's just, it's very, very indicative of what we call an enmeshed relationship. Um, There's a lot of knowledge about each other. Uh, It's really hard for them not to fight because they have a hard time not fighting uh, enmeshed people tend to fight a lot. Um, and they're also capable of, of extreme intimacy in sometimes. It, it, the, the whole movie starts with them both crying while they're listening to a book on tape. And so they, they share this very real moment with each other, and then they instantly start fighting. 
Um, also, other signs were that Lady Bird, the daughter, she wants to go to college away from the West Coast. She wants to go to the East Coast because, presumably, because she wants to get away from her mom, you know. And and at the same time, so so the the daughter seemingly really wants to get away from the mom, but at the same time, she she confides in the mom a lot. She she asks the mom for advice about sex and and so the daughter part a very tempting way of looking at these relationships is that it's all the mom's fault and the movie kind of goes in that direction but but not as bad as other kinds of movies in this of this nature the the fact is as a family therapist i'm here to tell you that children participate just as much as parents do and now there are situations where the parents are much more to blame, shall we say, to the situation. But kids, in my experience, are uh, very much participants and often are equal, if not um, um, you know, more significant drivers of the enmeshment bus, shall, I, shall we say. Um, also, another sign of enmeshment is that when people start talking crap about her, her mom. So when Lady Bird's talking with her friends and her friends are like, man, your mom's kind of crazy or your mom's sort of pushy and stuff. Uh, Lady Bird, the daughter will defend her mom. You know, she'll say like, oh, you know, she, she just loves me too much. And so that's very accurate. When, you, when you're enmeshed, you, you feel very defensive of that person. As a, as a, you know, a professor of family therapy, when I um, start training new family therapists, one of the things that we do is we ask them to look into their own lives and look into their own childhoods. And the, there's, there's, there's always a, the, the same sorts of people enter the classes that I teach, shall we say, the same similar uh, distribution of profiles, shall we say. And one of the profiles is an enmeshed child of an enmeshed parent. And since most therapists are women, it's it's often an uh, a woman in my class who had an enmeshed relationship with with her mother, and there's different presentations of that enmeshment. And one of them is that when I ask them this sort of person to write about their childhood, they can sometimes become very defensive about that and say like, you know, how how dare you ask me to talk crap about my family? When in fact, I never asked them to talk crap about their family. I, I just asked them to, to analyze their family. And if, and if their family was perfect, then, then, then write about how perfect the family was. But there's this knee jerk reaction of like um, defensiveness, uh, you know, a, a, a wish or a desire to protect the image of their mothers or fathers in. Uh, to the outside world. So inwardly, they might really hate their mother, but outwardly, they, they try to protect that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's a barrier to young or to novice therapists as they try to discover their own counter-transference vulnerabilities. Anyway, I thought I would read a, a list of enmeshed relationship qualities. And if you're using this list as a way of trying to figure out whether or not your relationships are enmeshed or not. Understand that whenever you try to categorize all of human existence, it's hard to do. And that for some people, when they're, they'll, they'll ask me in class, I'll say like, well, you know, my relationships had some of the enmeshed qualities, but also some of them that aren't in that, in that category. You know, what do I do? And I say, well, it sounds like you have a mixture of, of it. So don't try to think of it as like a black and white thing. So, your relationships might have some of these things, they might have all of these things, um, and it really just comes down to the larger description of your particular unique relationships that you have. But in terms of the way that we conceptualize and mesh relationships, they often have the following qualities. There's often a, a fair amount of dissatisfaction in the relationship. Both people tend to be dissatisfied. Enmeshment is not closeness. That's a very important thing to understand is that when you have an enmeshed relationship, it's not close. You can be close to a family, you know, a mother and daughter can be very close, but have healthy boundaries and not have too much overlap in terms of their identity. So and they'll tend to be satisfied with, with the relationship. And mesh people, when you really get them to be honest with you, they'll say, no, I'm not satisfied with the relationship. And in this movie, Lady Bird, you see that. You see ongoing tension and 
um, dissatisfaction between Lady Bird and her mother. You, you have what we call emotional fusion in that it's hard to have a an emotional experience that isn't at least somewhat influenced by the other person. Uh, the relationship tends to be dysfunctional in that it, it creates more conflict than is needed and might even create so much conflict that uh, your daughter has to move all the way across the country to um, you know, be able to breathe and think. It tends to be inflexible, meaning that if, if Lady Bird and her mother were to come to my office and I you know, tried to experiment, tried to help them experiment with more healthy boundaries, it would be very hard for them to do that. It's, so enmeshed relationships tend to be, uh, by, by their nature, they're inflexible because flexible boundaries in relationships, healthy, flexible boundaries are able to respond to each other's needs and are, are able to adjust in a way that helps people thrive. And in this relationship depicted in the movie Lady Bird, you see the relationship between daughter and mother as being rigid and inflexible to, uh, in, in, in response to different communications from both people. Um, we call these relationships too permeable, meaning that the boundary is too permeable. There's, there's too much going across the boundary between two of them. Um, there's a, what we call a diffuse boundary. A healthy boundary is not a closed boundary, but it's one that is flexible to each other's needs. It's flexible to the situation and it's flexible to communication that each person is giving. And it allows for exchange across the, you know, between the two people, but it also doesn't allow for so much that it ends up ruining each other's lives. Other words that we have for enmeshment are over-involved or lack of clear boundary or being overprotective of each other. Um, individuation is sacrificed for loyalty. So that's an important thing is that uh, like in this movie, you see Lady Bird trying to individuate. She's trying to figure out who she is. She's trying to establish herself in relation to her family. She's trying to say, look, this is me and that's you and you have to let me do me. And uh, in the relationship you see, particularly like maybe before the movie starts, you, 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 you note that Lady Bird, the daughter's individuation has been sacrificed for loyalty between the two people. Uh, there's also a feeling of being threatened when there's disagreement or difference. So in a healthy boundary, you can disagree or you can think differently and it's okay. You know, you're just like, well, you know, not the best that we don't agree, but I don't know. It's not going to destroy our lives. Whereas when you're enmeshed, it's, it's, just, it's seen as a threat when, when you disagree. And so, uh, and you see this in the movie, you see that whenever they disagree, there's a lot of tension between them. And, and a lot of effort to try to get each other to agree. There's also probably too much interaction between the two people. I don't want to label, I don't want to, you know, say that there's a healthy amount of interaction between a, a mother and, and her daughter, because that's a sort of male perspective in terms of like, you need to be independent or something like that. So I'm not going to label and, and that, but often it's part of the, uh, treatment involves not having so much interaction between two people, you know, letting the daughter do some things on her own, letting the mother do some things on her own. Also, um, one person may need the other to be a certain way in order for them to feel good. So there's a little bit of that, like the mother seems to require the daughter to be a certain way. Otherwise, the mother doesn't feel good about herself and doesn't feel happy or safe or something. There's also in enmeshed relationships, a tendency to use guilt in relationships. There's a tendency to use guilt trips and to make the other person feel guilty as a way of trying to control their behavior. And you certainly see, certainly see a bunch of that. Also, there's often a lot of um, controlling and management of, of that guilt. So, and you can kind of see that in Lady Bird. Since it's told from Lady Bird's perspective, you see her kind of feeling guilty and you, you see her trying to manage that. Um, and in mesh relationships, as I've been talking about, there tends to be a tendency for, for in mesh relationships to have periods of calm with, with a short bursts of conflict. And they kind of depict that in the movie. 
Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. The, the enmeshed people often know a lot about each other too. They often know a lot of details about each other as opposed to people with healthy boundaries or even distant boundaries. You find that enmeshed people know a lot of details about the other person. Oh, another detail about individuation that I just remembered is that Lady Bird, her, her real name is Christine. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to really spoil this movie because there's no real way to spoil it. Um, plus, I'm going to avoid saying anything spoiling. But, but one of the things that you learn, I think early on, is that Lady Bird, her, her real name is uh, Christine. And at some point in, you know, midway through high school, she says, I want to be called Lady Bird now. And, and you see that tension. So she's like demanding that her mom call her this other name. And it's her way, Christine's way or Lady Bird's way of trying to individuate, trying to say like, look, you named me Christine, but I'm going to name me something else because that's me. That's my name. And, and it's this, it's a, you know, when you can't actually individuate in, in healthy, normal ways, you might re resort to other ways as trying to individuate like, um, dyeing your hair a particular color or rebelling or using drugs or changing your first name. Um, also, there's, there's, a, there's a, a tendency for enmeshed people to assume that they can read each other's minds. Also, they in session will often interrupt each other or they'll speak over each other or speak for each other. And there's also an intense need for each other's approval. And you certainly see that. Um, okay, so how did this enmeshed relationship develop between the mother and the child? Did it just, you know, come out of nowhere? Is it all the mother's fault? Well, there's a very brief line in the movie, and again, I'm not really spoiling much. The mother says that her mother was an abusive alcoholic. She's just like, uh, well, my mother was, a, you know, an alcoholic, abusive person. There's no talk about the father, but we, so, so we know that the mother... Lady Bird's mother had a difficult childhood, seemingly. And this difficult childhood seemingly resulted in a number of, of effects for the mother. Uh, that, she, you know, now they don't explicitly say this. This is me inferring based on uh, my experience with uh, families like this, is that when you are denied a childhood as a person and you grow up and you have your own kids, and you raise your kids better, you know, because the mom's not an alcoholic. She, you know, she works hard and she's probably a lot better of a mom than her own mother was. Well, there's this weird thing that happens that I've seen a lot in which the parent will resent their child for being allowed to have a childhood. So let's break that down. So you grow, so let's say I grow up in a terrible childhood and I, I vow I'm never going to put my own kids through that problem. I grow up, I have kids, and then I try to raise my kids well. I give them, you know, love. I give them space. I give them money when they want it. I, I don't abuse them. Well, even though I'm doing a good thing, I, because I still have unresolved issues related to my childhood, I resent, I'm sort of jealous of my own children for having a good life. So it's this weird paradox. It's like, yeah, I wanted, I want to do right by my kids in a way that I wasn't, you know, in a way that I wasn't treated, which makes me feel good. But this also makes me feel bad because I'm watching this person get something that I never got. And then that, and that sort of touches on an old wound in a parent of just like, God damn it. I didn't get, I didn't get that. I didn't get love. I didn't get stability. And look at this spoiled brat little kid getting all these great things. How dare this kid just flaunt how great their life is? Now, it's it's not rational thinking, but you know, humans aren't rational. So so because the mother had that difficult childhood, my analysis of it is that she resented her own daughter for having a good childhood and therefore would have, was around her in a very was it was in a very bad mood around her and, and would treat her not so great. There's also this Naj conflict uh, concept, this Naj concept called destructive entitlement, in which, as a child, if you grow up and 
you are not given enough. You know, you're not given enough love. You're not given enough attention. You're not given enough attachment security. You're not given enough stability. Well, you retain this, what they call destructive entitlement, which is you're just like, well, if the world is going to give me a pile of crap, then I'm going to give everyone else a pile of crap because that is how I can, you know, create balance in my life. I've been given too much crap. And so I've got to unload some of this crap on other people. And the way I'm going to unload this crap is by treating everyone else like crap. (laughs) So now it's a, it's kind of a shorthand for psychodynamic thinking, but essentially it's just the idea that, and, and it's a, it's a metaphor of accounting, shall we say, of a, a ledger of fairness is what he called it. It's like, look, life has been unfair to me. And so therefore I'm going to make life unfair for other people. It's, it's a common human reaction to mistreatment. Another way of looking at this is projective identification. I've talked about this at length at other episodes, but in a nutshell, essentially we reenact our relationships from our childhood. And so um, the primary element or one of the primary elements or components or experiences that the mother had when she was a child was that she had an abusive alcoholic mother. Well, abuse alone is bad, right? But one of the major, one of the main elements that children are harmed by is how it feels like a rejection. You know, when, when your parent abuses you, it's, it's a form of rejection. It's like, you know, because you spilt the milk, I'm going to beat you now. And even though I'm close to you physically, I'm actually rejecting you mentally. I'm saying like, you are not, you're not good enough. You're not good enough for me to be nice to you in this moment. And so it's an extreme rejection. And also alcoholic parents are often absent, which can result in a lot of abandonment and rejection feelings on, on the you know, behalf of the kids. And so the mother grows up and uh, she internalized, as a child, she internalized all this, you know, relationship stuff. And then she reenacts this with her daughter as she, you know, when she has her own family. And so one of the way, so she has to create the relationship again. She has to create that experience that she had with her own mother. And again, one of the main components of that relationship with her own mother was one of rejection. And so how do you get your daughter to reject you? You know, how do you recreate that rejection with your daughter? Well, you are very mean to her and you're um, condescending and you're sarcastic and you pressure her and you push her and, you know, you criticize her. That's a very sure way to get your daughter to reject you. And so the mother through projective identification, she's trying to heal from the past, but she uh, unknowingly recreates the past by make, sort of pushing her daughter to reject her. Also, she, there's when you are treated badly as a child and abused and neglected, you don't know what good parenting looks like because you've never had good parenting. And parents tend to do very similar parenting techniques to their own parents. It's bizarre, you know, like parents out there, you know, it's like, you don't want to act like your parents, or maybe you had great parents, so maybe you want to act like them. But but for those parents out there who had bad parents themselves, you'll say like, yeah, I never wanted a parent like the way my mom or dad did. And yet you will find yourself doing similar things. Now, hopefully with work and therapy and contemplation, if you were mistreated, you won't Uh, be as bad, but you're going to do some of the same stuff. And so as a, as a, you know, the mom in this movie, Lady Bird's mom, she doesn't really know what loving balanced parenting looks like. And therefore, as she attempts to achieve that, she doesn't really know what direction to go in, you know, also through what she experienced the mother as a childhood, she became attachment injured and grew up with an insecure attachment style as an adult and specifically a preoccupied or anxious attachment style. You know, there's, there's so much of that in the movie, but as an example, Lady Bird wants to spend Thanksgiving with her boyfriend and the mother passive aggressively gets back at her at that. She, she really does not um, like the fact that her daughter is spending Thanksgiving with someone else. It really hurts her, which leads me into the next, um, um, 
piece of analysis here about the, the mother's personality is that she's on the borderline spectrum. She's, she's very mildly borderline. I know, I know I keep talking about borderline. Um, <clears throat> it's like whenever I do an analysis of a movie, I'm trying to avoid talking about borderline because I feel like I talk about it too much. But this movie, Lady Bird, is such a great depiction of mild borderline. Um, which is honestly weird because there are so many other disorders and so many other types of personalities that humans, uh, per, that humans have and that I see in my office. But for whatever reason in the movies and TV and TV shows, borderline is just, it just, I guess it just lends itself so well to uh, the screen. Uh, and I, I don't really know exactly what that is. And I can't tell if it's because I'm seeing it, you know, I just, I have such a broad definition of borderline or something, but anyway, so, so basically, you know, the mother was mistreated. She has these relational traumas. It leads to her having actual PTSD regarding relationships and, and being abandoned and being hurt. And so it results in these sort of classic uh, borderline personality. Now, for those of you who don't listen to other episodes of this podcast, I talk about borderline personality. I don't talk about borderline personality disorder. I don't talk about what's described in the DS DSM or what's what's understood to be in the DSM, because that is one version of an extreme version. Their borderline is a spectrum and you can have extremely mild borderline or you can have extreme, you can have extreme severe borderline. And, and this character, the mother played by, um, you know, Jackie from Roseanne, Jackie, um, the sister of Roseanne in the Roseanne TV show, um, she uh, exhibits what I would call a, a mild case of, of borderline. It, she might have a moderate case if I were to talk with her in more depth and understand maybe her inner life. Maybe she is, you know, suicidal and this kind of stuff. But anyway, things like she takes things very personally. She's she's easily hurt. These are sort of classic borderline personality traits. Uh, or behaviors. And again, it stems from rejection trauma as a child. And if you want more detail on that theory, you can listen to the, I don't know, the six or seven other episodes in which I talk in detail about that. But you can really see this in Lady Bird. You know, you can really see the mother uh, very anxious about her relationship with her daughter. She's, uh, she takes things very personally and she's very easily hurt. Hurt primarily by things that Lady Bird is doing to individuate, you know? So if, if you were, if you grew up with very insecure attachments and, and you feel as though, um, you are desperate for stable, close relationships with people, you're, all you want to do is just, uh, find a few people whom you can depend on, who will be stable and normal and, and then you can finally just relax. That's, that's how borderline people generally feel. And they feel chronically alone and rejected and broken on the inside. And so when you have kids, one of the things that you can do is you can actually kind of rope your kids into that by becoming enmeshed with them and by saying, well, you know, if I can't find relationships in the real world, I'll, I'll have children and they won't leave me surely because they need me. Well, prior to the beginning of this movie, Lady Bird, you get the sense that they, they were very close and they, and the mother did sort of indoctrinate the daughter. The mother did indoctrinate the daughter into that enmeshed relationship so that the mother could feel close to somebody and have someone that won't leave her. Well, as Lady Bird, the daughter enters a later high school, she starts to want to break free like any young person would like many young people do. And as she starts to do that, it creates this tremendous tension between her and her, her and her daughter. And basically the entire movie is uh, her senior year. And you just see that developing over time. Another bit of psychology that we can look into here is systems theory. You know, when we look at the overall system, uh, particularly including the dad into the mother daughter relationship, we see that the dad was depressed and also very permissive as a parent. He was very um, easygoing and seemingly didn't have a lot of rules for the daughter. I mean, we didn't see the whole portrayal of their parenting style, but we definitely see the dad. He's the nice guy and the mom is the bad guy. 
the mom even says, uh, you know, I, if your dad's going to always be the nice guy, then, that, then I have to be the bad guy. And this is a very common dysfunction in parents that I see. It's what we call complementary or a rigid relationship. You know, there's, there's probably, if, we, if this was a real family, we would probably see lots of irresponsible behavior on, on behalf of the father. And, you know, for example, we did see something in that the dad, in a way that I'm really glad that he did in the story, because I, you know, I wanted this to happen, but the dad basically participated in a lie with the daughter. I won't spoil it in the movie, but, but the dad basically sneaks around behind the mom's back uh, with the daughter. Uh, on this, uh, the basically, so it's not really that big of a deal. That the daughter wants to go to an East Coast school and is trying to get financial aid, and the dad helps her fill out the financial aid forms. But they both say, "Well, never tell your mom about this," you know. And there's there's a few times where the dad's like that. He's just like, "Well, don't tell your mom," you know. Don't tell your mom. So, you know, imagine you ask your child to lie to your spouse. You know, that's. That's not responsible parenting in, in general. Uh, if the situation is extremely abusive, then, and you could even argue that this relationship was on the abusive side, um, then you, know, you could say it's justified. I don't know. But the point is, is that when you look at this system, this three-person triangle, you see a dad who is depressed, who probably has low self-esteem, who is struggling quite a bit, and is the nice guy. And, then you ha- and, and he has a lot of empathy. And you have the mom who is the one who's trying to hold everything together. She's the one who has the job. She's the one who's trying to get everyone to be responsible. She's the one who is monitoring the daughter's life a lot closer. And then you have the daughter who is close to the dad, but is enmeshed with the mom and is always trying to please the mom and participates in um, sort of uh, actions with the dad that sort of scapegoat the mom. And it's a very common scenario, a very common triangle that I see in families um, and doesn't help because essentially when you look at the family system, so a very tempting thing to, to do if you saw this family in therapy would be to tell the mom to stop it. You know, just like, Hey mom, lay off. Well, unless you get the dad in the room and actually help him to become less permissive, then it's going to compel the mother to be controlling. So you want balance in the parents. You want you want the dad to start participating in some of the responsible actions that you have to take as a parent, which relieves the mother from having to do those things. So, okay. So in conclusion, I'll say it's a delightful movie. I highly recommend it. It's basically a coming of age movie. It's funny. It's moving. It's not very heavy, really. There's no like, um, it's not Manchester by the sea, you know, it's, but it's, it's a similar kind of movie in that there's no real plot, you know, it's just like the senior year of this teenage girl and her interactions. It's sort of like boyhood, if you remember boyhood, but uh, it's like a funny, more quicker boyhood, if that makes sense. You know how in boyhood where it's like, There were these scenes where you're like, oh, you know, I remember what that felt like. Where it felt very realistic. Well, this this movie has a lot of that in it, where you're just like, oh yeah, I remember what that felt. I remember what senior year in high school, particularly if you graduated from high school in 2002 or around there. (laughs) There, it's sort of like nostalgia for that generation. You know, there's a lot of Dave Matthews and um, just other stuff like that. The the dress, you know, you remember sort of bell bottoms were coming back in style in the early aughts, late nineties and, um, very short shirts. If you remember that, like, you know, um, I don't know what you call those, but midriff shirts for girls, you know, there was some of that in there. And, um, so, you know, it's funny because 2002, it was so long ago now that you can have a, a period piece movie about 2002. <laughs> Um, there's some nine 11 stuff, you know, uh, not that it's funny, but it's nostalgia, I suppose. Um, and it's interesting for me because I remember when the eighties was not, you know, cause to me, my, my teenage years were in the eighties. And I remember when the eighties, I remember when the very first eighties movies started coming out and just thinking like, Oh my God, they're making eighties period movies. 
And then um, there wasn't a lot of 90s period movies, if I think about it, you know, because it's kind of hard to define the 90s. I mean, grunge, I suppose, hip hop, early hip hop. But um, but anyway, so if you're a younger person, you graduated from high school around 2002, which I guess would mean you'd be born in 84-ish. Is that 84? Is that right? 18? Yeah, so you're born around 84. Then this movie will probably be, you know, very interesting to you. Um, there were some other kind of 2002 things like books on tape. Uh, I remember listening to a lot of books on tape in that late, late nineties, early aughts. Um, cell phones are just starting, you know, not everyone has one and they're big bulky uh, flip phones, you know, uh, like I said, Dave Matthews, there's some other songs in there too, that, that are very 2002. Um, those those uh, necklaces that girls would wear that are kind of like they're like chokers, I guess you'd call them. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, let's see, the lip rings are starting to come in fashion. <laughs> lip lip lip, you know, ear piercings and stuff. Anyway, but yeah, it's it's a delightful movie. Um, I gave it an eight out of ten. I'm guessing other people are gonna would rate it higher. Um, I really liked it. I was very much taken by the characters. I don't give eight out of 10 to movies very often. It's, I probably rate, uh, I think, I think, um, of the movies that I see, I probably give 10% of the movies I see an eight or higher, maybe 5% or something. It's pretty rare. So I, I really liked it. Um, particularly if you're a mother or a daughter, <laughs> I'm guessing. But honestly, as a guy who was neither a mother or a daughter, I, I really, really liked it. I thought it was great. The editing was fantastic. Um, there, you know, the, It's edited in this very quick economical way that um, you know, they don't, the, Greta Gerwig doesn't linger on scenes any longer than they have to be, which is, I love it when directors do that, when it's just like, you know, let's, let's just move on. You know, like we don't need to, we, I don't need to show off my cinematography skills in this scene. Let's just get to the next part of the story. Um, the writing and directing is the main part here. The writing, directing, acting is, is just so believable, so natural. Um, the Ladybird character is such a fully developed character, you know, um, she, you really get, I remember like halfway through the movie, I was like, I remember, growing up with a girl like this, you know, just like this is, it's so consistent, the characters. And also there are so, there were so many opportunities in this story to have a villain. Um, you know, there are boyfriends that come in and out of her life and there are other kinds of characters. And there's, you know, there's a, uh, there's a nun who seems mean at first. And so there's all these like uh, people who I kept thinking, okay, here we go. You know, here, here's where we go, where we villainize this person, you know, and there's, and at every turn, uh, Greta Gerwig, the, the writer director, she decides to kind of, um, say, looks like we're headed toward the villain. And then she veers a sharp left. You know, she's like, Nope, this, this person's not a villain. He's, he's not that bad. He's a good person. He just has a different set of goals in his life right now. And there, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so there's, there were all these opportunities where I was like, oh no, here comes the villain. And then all of a sudden, nope, no villain. And that's how life is usually. It's very rare that you actually have villains in your life, you know, like the Billy Zanes on Titanic, you know, these, these people, when, when, I, when you're young, um, I find that I liked villains, you know, I, I, wanted the, I wanted to hate the villain, the Darth Vaders, you know. And as I get older, it's like, I start just hating movies that draw these black and white uh, distinctions between different people. Um, you know, I find it to be somewhat of a childhood way of looking, a childish way of looking at the world, which is fine when you're young, it's fine. But as I get older, it's just like, uh, that doesn't feel accurate to me. You know, people are generally good and they, and they all are trying their best. And <clears throat> usually when writers write in a villain, I find that it's probably a result of their own bias against a certain group of people, you know, like, Oh, here comes the douchebag frat boy. Of course, he's going to be a villain. And it's like, Oh, obviously the writer hates frat boys for, and doesn't know a frat boy in real life or doesn't know that they know a frat boy in real life or something. And so, 
Um, so this movie doesn't do that at all. And it, and it, and it feels, um, just so interesting to watch. The movie is about nothing. <laughs> it's just, it's just a year in the life of, of a, you know, 17, 18 year old girl. And, and I can't really spoil the movie because nothing really happens, but it was just so, and, in, and in, I, you know, I, I can't, I, under, I don't understand how uh, Greta Gerwig made, th- you know, that topic into such an interesting movie. And I'm so interested to find out what she comes up with next. I might actually assign this movie for my students. I, I used to assign the movie 13, if you know the movie 13, uh, with Holly Hunter as the mother. Um, 13 is similar to, it's sort of, 13 is like the movie they made 10 years ago, about this topic, um, you know, a sort of working class mother and daughter, you know, blah, 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 coming of age. But 13 is much more gritty and dramatic, I suppose. Lady Bird is um, much less, uh, much less, Lady Bird is, is fun to watch. It's a fun movie to watch, you know, anyway. So let me know what you thought of the movie. Uh, let me know what you think of my analysis. Let me know if you have anything to add to it. Let me know what you think about enmeshed relationships or if you come from an enmeshed relationship, I'd be uh, happy to hear about that. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.